In the middle of the 8th century CE, a small flotilla of flying ships were seen in the skies over Ireland, and a story soon began circulating around Western Europe that one of the sailors swam down to the people below. There are at least seven different versions of this story, with different details, but all share a few core elements and play to the same metaphysical themes. Like other sightings of UFOs, the story of the flying ship compels us to believe in a race of higher beings from a world beyond our own, and calls attention to our human limitations. The earliest references to flying ships over the British Isles are found in four Irish annals, or brief, year-by-year -year historical records of major events. There is also a mention in some manuscripts of the Book of Invasions, first compiled in the 11th century. The references in the annals, apparently recorded contemporaneously with the events, state variously that there were sightings in 743, 744, and 748 CE. Only the annals of Ulster, however, which date the sighting to 748, mention a location. The entry places the event at Clonmacnoise, a borough and monastery on the River Shannon that remained one of the leading centers of learning and culture in Ireland for the next 600 years. However, an offhand remark on a separate incident in the 12th century Book of Leinster states that three ships voyaging in the air were seen over an assembly for the Telton Games during the reign of King Domnall, which began in 743. Like Clonmacnoise, Telton, now called Telton, was also a site of great importance in Ireland, named for Teltu, a local goddess who is said to have died from exhaustion after clearing the Irish plains for agriculture. Telton was also the site of several Iron Age earthworks. However, none of the annals mention Telton as the setting. Between 1074 and 1084, Patrick, Bishop of Dublin, wrote a poem that lists a number of marvels in Irish legend, with a further embellished version of the Telton story. Patrick says only that an unspecified king at an unspecified assembly saw a ship glide through the air but adds that a man on that ship then cast a spear at a fish and missed. The spear fell to the ground, prompting the man to swim down through the air to recover it, as if he were underwater. Aristotle's writings on natural philosophy, the foundation of medieval physics, held that the atmosphere was sharply divided into three regions of vastly different densities. Given this, it would not be unreasonable to assume that a lighter being of the upper atmosphere would have to swim through our denser air like humans swim through water. A fuller account of this same story comes in the 14th century book of Ballymote, itself derived from the 12th century book of Glendalough. A corroborating and much abridged account is also found in the Irish version of the Historica Britonum. This version of events once again establishes the setting as the Telton Fair, but dates the incident to the reign of Cungalach Snoba, the High King of Ireland from 944 to 956 CE. However, none of the Irish annals mention sightings of flying ships in Cungalach's reign, and there is evidence that the Telton Games had ceased to be held under his predecessor. Historian John Kerry has suggested that the name of the king and the date of the incident were both deliberately changed for political reasons. It's likely that the incident, if ever one occurred, took place in the middle of the 8th century, as the annals attest. In this version, it's claimed that Kungalak perceived a ship in the air, with a few crew members on an open deck. One of the sailors threw a fishing spear at a salmon, perhaps a cooked one at the feast, perhaps a live one in the nearby Blackwater River, or perhaps even one spotted in the air, the text does not specify. When the spear missed the fish and fell in the midst of the fair, its caster dove from the ship's deck and swam down to get it. As the sailor grabbed the top of the spear, a man on the ground grabbed it at the bottom end. You are drowning me, cried the sailor, and Kungalak ordered that his captor let him go, allowing him to swim back up to the ship. This account establishes several key plot points common to all later versions of the story, a ship in the sky drops an object before an assembly of people, so a sailor descends to our level to retrieve it, before being apprehended by the crowd. 
After a struggle with his captors, the sailor either drowns or is released after a human authority warns that he will drown, and the ship flies away. These tropes endured, but many of the details changed in later versions. A significant mutation of the story of the flying ship can be found in a manuscript collection of monastic legends located in the Advocates Library in Edinburgh, Scotland. In this version of events, the clergy of Clonmacnoise were assembled at the monastery when they saw a ship in the sky above, which then dropped its anchor. As the anchor landed in the clergy's midst, they seized it, prompting a man from the ship to come down, swimming as if through water. When the man reached the anchor, the cleric seized him too. At this point, the man exclaimed, For God's sake, let me go, for you are drowning me, then released himself and swam away. Carey has argued that this telling is a deliberately altered version of that contained in the Book of Ballymote that likely dates to the 12th century. The addition of an anchor, he suggests, indicates a conflation with another Irish legend about a group of sailors dropping their anchor in the ocean and discovering that it struck the oratory of an inhabited underwater monastery. Another variation of the story is found in the work of Geoffroy du Bruy, a 12th century chronicler and abbot of Vigeois, France. Sometime between 1170 and 1184, Geoffroy wrote a history of a Cenobitic monastic community in which he claimed that the people of London saw a ship in the sky that dropped its anchor in the middle of the city. Once again, a sailor leapt off the ship and dislodged the anchor, only to be captured by the people of London and drowned in water, presumably in the River Thames. This is the sole version of the story in which the captors deliberately kill the sailor, and it's likely that Geoffroy misinterpreted a source, which claimed that the sailor drowned as if in water, or warned that he would drown in the air if not released. The next to mention the story of the flying ship is Gervais of Tilbury, an English cleric and statesman who served in the court of Otto of Brunswick of the Holy Roman Empire. In his Otia Imperialia, a kind of survey book for his benefactor, published around 1211, Gervais gives what's now the most well-known variant of the story. After Mass on a holy day, the congregation of an unspecified church in Britain saw an anchor fixed to a stone tomb in the churchyard, with its cable stretched tight up to the clouds. The people saw the rope moving as though being pulled from above, and they even heard muffled voices through the clouds. Then, a man came climbing down the rope hand over hand, with his legs dangling below him. While attempting to free the anchor, the man was seized by some bystanders, and died after a brief struggle, stifled by the breath of our gross air, as a shipwrecked mariner is stifled in the sea, to use Gervais's words. After an hour, the rope fell to the ground as if cut from above, leaving the anchor where it lay. The final variation on the story of the flying ship comes in an Old Norse text intended for the Norwegian king, written around 1250. The Konings Skuja, or the King's Mirror, relocates the event to Clonmacnoise. One Sunday, a mass at a church dedicated to St. Kiran was interrupted when an anchor was dropped from the sky as if thrown from a ship, lodging itself in the arch above the church door. The congregation rushed outside to see a ship with several men on board at the other end of the rope. One of these men dove overboard and swam down to the ground in an apparent attempt to release the anchor. The author states explicitly that the movements of his hands and feet, and all his actions, appeared like those of a man swimming in the water. As he was trying to free the anchor, the assembled crowd rushed in to grab him. However, the Bishop of Clonmacnoise ordered the people to release the man, as he worried that his containment at ground level might prove fatal as when one is held underwater. Once released, the man then swam back up to the ship before the crew cut the rope and sailed away. Once again, they left the anchor, which was said to remain in place at the time of the source's writing, though there is no trace of it today. Though none of the accounts of the Irish flying ship agree completely, there are enough common elements to suggest that all derive from a single event, or perhaps two events, that occurred in the middle of the 8th century CE. 
The event or events may have simply been the sighting of three manned ships in the sky, or they may have involved a sailor throwing a spear to the ground and swimming down to retrieve it. All later variations of the story, and all of those that mention anchors, appear to be corruptions of the original records, mixed with existing legend. But these stories were not the first or only of their kind. The 16th century scholar Stefano Breventano noted that there were celestial ships seen over Rome in 215 BCE, on the verge of Hannibal's invasion of Italy. In 815 CE, Agobard, the Spanish-born Archbishop of Lyon, published a treatise on hail and thunder, in which he lamented the fact that so many Franks believed that human wizards, or tempestari, could summon storms by magic. He added that it was also widely believed that there existed a realm above the clouds called Magonia, inhabited by human-like beings with flying ships. It was said that the Magonians had an agreement with the Tempestari, in which they paid them to summon violent storms over the countryside, then sailed over the path of destruction, plundering the harvest of the hail-battered crops. Agobard even claimed that some people once presented him with four shackled captives that had allegedly fallen from a Magonian ship, imploring him to have them executed. The Sky People, later called Sylphs by the 16th century Swiss theologian Paracelsus, made frequent appearances in early modern popular art and literature, where they were often portrayed in association with demons and stormy weather. What's more, in 1896 and 7, there were thousands of sightings of mystery airships over the continental United States. People saw a variety of fantastical contrivances, including flapping wings, downward-facing propellers, and even open-deck ships. On April 28, 1897, the Houston Post reported on an eerily familiar event alleged to have occurred in the new railroad town of Merkel, Texas. A small crowd was returning from church on a Sunday when they saw an anchor being dragged along the ground, pulled by a rope from the sky. As the anchor was pulled across the railroad, it got caught on a rail, at which point the people gathered were able to see that the rope was suspended from what appeared to be a flying craft with several lit windows and a headlight. A small man in a blue sailor's uniform climbed down the rope and cut it with a knife, freeing the craft to sail off into the northeast. The anchor was said to be on display at a local blacksmith's shop, but like the anchors in the 12th century versions of the story, no trace of it now remains. All of these alleged incidents are properly classified as UFO sightings, but how exactly they relate to modern reports of silver saucers and balls of light is an open question. There are many aesthetic differences between the flying ships over Ireland and the sleek metal discs seen in the 1950s, for example, and there are major methodological difficulties in comparing reports from such vastly different times and places. However, all sightings of skyships before the 20th century involved flying craft that appeared very similar to transportation technologies already common at the time, but also exhibited a previously unattained capacity for flight. For example, all of the medieval flying ships appeared to be floating on the top of our region of air in the same way that ships float on water, and yet, they appeared to represent the accomplishment of lighter-than-air flight, later achieved with hot air balloons. The mystery airships of the late 1890s displayed a mix of failed 19th century mechanisms for generating lift, and yet appeared to represent the accomplishment of heavier-than-air flight, later achieved with airplanes. Only in the 1940s and 50s, as humanity took its first steps towards leaving the planet, did UFOs appear to represent the accomplishment of interplanetary flight, later achieved by unmanned drones. True or not, the stories of the flying ship over Ireland are all quite rich in symbolism. As Clive Hart surmised in his book, The Prehistory of Flight, most dreams of flight take us, potentially, away from earthly bounds, set us free from earthly bonds. The flying ship, on the other hand, comes to us, and, in the typical story, it is briefly ensnared by our mundane entanglements. A tombstone, death, or a church door, established moral law, momentarily restrains the freedom of the flyers. The bond is quickly broken, but while it lasts we have a hurried opportunity to establish contact. Above and below are linked, as they were in the dream of Jacob's Ladder, allowing human access through the medium of air to the heavenly regions. 
John Kerry added that these stories illustrated the transgression of our habitual ideas of human space, a common theme in early Irish literature. The Celtic scholar, Proentius MacKenna, claimed that all the different versions of the story show that monastics were experimenting imaginatively with the inversions of reality, implicit in the whole concept of the other world, and exploring the relationship between the natural and the supernatural, as well as the relativities of time and space that were implicit in their interaction. Real or imagined, all of these encounters seem to have had the function of compelling the witnesses, as well as those who heard their stories, to accept the existence of higher, less physical beings, who inhabited a world that was literally and figuratively above our own. Although the stories of the flying ship showed that these beings could occasionally penetrate the barrier to our world below, they also served to reinforce the hierarchy that divided us from them. The beings from this higher level of existence were unable to survive in the lower, cruder air that we breathed on Earth, not to mention the fact that humans seemed decidedly hostile to their passing through. Every version of the story from the 12th century on involves a sailor fighting off human attackers while frantically trying to detach himself from a thing of worldly importance, at risk of his life. Hart suggests that these stories would have reminded medieval peoples of their inevitable bondage to the Earth, though he also speculates that they might also have spurred 14th century thinkers like Albert of Saxony and Nicole Oresma to consider the physical possibility of a flying ship. Both writers imagined, for the first time in Western history, that a manned vessel could float on the boundaries between the first two layers of the atmosphere, much as a nautical ship sails on the surface of the water. After all, this is exactly how it was implied that the ships sailed in the medieval stories. In the late 1960s and early 1970s, ufologists Jacques Vallée and John Keel first pioneered the theory that UFOs changed their form, or our perception of their form, according to the witnesses' cultural expectations, and exhibited technologies that evolved in step with humanity's cutting edge. In other words, the content of UFO sightings is always constructed within the cultural and technological frame of reference of the witnesses, and plays to the belief systems already established in the witnesses' culture. Certainly, the stories of skyships over Ireland were distinctly medieval in nature, but they may have some deeper connection to the wider UFO phenomenon. Whether real or imagined, the many stories of flying ships over Ireland and the fleeting connection between the earth and sky serve to reinforce many aspects of the medieval European cosmology. The stories seem to reinforce the idea that humankind was bound to earth and could only catch passing glimpses of the higher spiritual realms, as well as the freedom of the open skies. It also compelled medieval Christians to accept the reality of higher beings in the heavens, or upper atmosphere, who could occasionally enter our world below. If nothing else, these stories kept people talking about flying ships for most of the Middle Ages, and may have prompted the first serious discussions of lighter-than-air craft. YouTube is hiding our videos now, and ad revenue is way down from what it was. Help us keep making these videos by pledging a monthly donation on Patreon, or sending a tip at buymeacoffee.com or PayPal.